Officers, ladies and gentlemen, will you please be upstanding to receive the worship for the Mayor of Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to welcome the Charter Trustees to this meeting of the Paul Charter Trustees and to the press and members of the public if there's any. Um, in order to ensure the meeting is managed effectively, please could everyone follow these ground rules. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand physically to indicate. Where there appears to be consensus in the meeting for a motion, I will ask if there's any dissension when a formal vote is required, this will be carried out by a show of hands. Charter trustees are advised that there is no live stream of this meeting. However, it will be recorded via a 360-degree camera and uploaded following the meeting. Please also note that we are required to vacate this room by 7 p.m. Before we start the business on this agenda, as you know, the Charter Trustees is a non-political body and the primary objective being to maintain and promote the historic and ceremonial traditions of Paul. I am keen that we all work together to maintain this objection. Um, agenda one, apologies. Um, item one, apologies, any apologies? Thank you, Mr Mayor. We've had apologies have been received from Councillor Beasley, Councillor Broadhead, Councillor Hadley and Councillor Iyengar. And uh, apologies for Councillor Jewsbert, Councillor Mohan Iyengar and Councillor Steve Barron. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And I think there's also... That's the slides in there. Oh. Thank you for um, apologies from Councillor Matthews, Maidment, Robson and Earl. Thank you. Right. Item two, declaration of interests. And I can see a hand up. Um, LJ and Mike Brook. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, as I think most Charter Trustees are aware, uh, four councillors here are members of the Pool, Char uh, Pool Sherbrooke Twinning Association and we shall be removing ourselves when discussing the item on the budget. However, for transparency, I also want to declare that I'm a member of the Society of Pool, and I believe we're discussing the Beating the Bounds Festival coming up this year. Thank you. Fine, thank you, Mr Mayor. It's the um, item eight on the budget and as a committee member of Pool Twinning, Sherbrooke Twinning Association. Um, is it, uh, yeah, I'm the chairman of the Paul Sherbrooke Twinning Association, so again, I will be making myself uh, absent during that particular item. Thank you. And I think I can add to that previous declaration of interest, and I will also be leaving the um, meeting for the discussion of that item. I am honorary president of the Paul Sherbrooke Twinning Association, and I also believe that I am honorary president of Paul... Society for Paul. Um, so, um, but um, I don't think there's anything of any significance to that there, but um, I will be um, leaving the item to do with Paul Charter Trustee, um, and the Paul Sherbrooke Twinning Association. Right. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping this hasn't changed too much. Um, confirmation of minutes and matters arising. Um, yeah. The charter trustees 
are asked to receive the minutes of the meeting held on 26th of October and to consider any matters arising. Have we any matters arising? No. Looks like we um, accept that. We just need to check that agrees. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I think they have agreed. Um, I think there was another item that I think was on the original um, sheet, and that was that I, I hope that we can all stand and um, remember um, Les Burden, who was... That's the next, that's the next item, I'm sorry. That's the next. Well, the item's on the yeah. agenda anyway, yes. Um, yeah, before I up update you on my recent activities since the last meeting of the Charter of Trustees, many of you will be aware that sadly Les Burden, former Mayor of Paul in 2004, passed away on Thursday 29th of December at home and his funeral took place on Monday the 16th of December. We send our heartfelt condolences to his widow Roro and please be upstanding to observe a minute's silence. Thank you. Please be seated. I will now present my report on the last three months. Apologies if it's um, longer than it could be, because I've had a really busy couple of days and I didn't have a chance to edit it. But at least I just about managed to get it printed out before the um, printer decided that it had definitely ran out of ink. Over this last three months, I've attended around 25 events, about a quarter of what a previous pre-pandemic, pre-BCP mayor might have attended. Four of those events were in tight succession, so they covered around 23 days. The deputy mayor covered a further two. With a long period of not very good health in these recent months, I suspect I should have passed over another couple of events. The mayoress overheard one comment when I was struggling with a virtual loss of voice to the effect, at least it was brief. <laughs> I'll give you a clue as to what it was. I had my own John Redwood moment when I didn't realise that the words on the... On the uh, that I had the words on the reverse of a bit of paper and found myself lost in the second verse of Jerusalem, and I was on stage. Very much a John Redwood moment, that was. I suspect that event was a bit of a low point, but I did buy a rather interesting locally made plate with an intriguing colour tinkle bob. Two days later, I planted a tree, which got nicked shortly afterwards. <laughs> it, it all happens. Um, <laughs> I then went on to launch the poppy appeal. That was a fantastic event. Um, my ultimate role seemed to end up taking card payments at the stall, whilst the mayoress and a 95-year-old veteran did the roll-up bit. We took rather a lot during our stint, as a combination of chains and medals and the sheer enthusiasm and cheek of the vet veteran kept us busy throughout taking payments. A good day. We had a busy week in the run-up to Remembrance Sunday. 
with a display of handmade poppies and tour of lampposts on Tamford Heath, Parkstone Sea Cadets Awards, the High Sheriff of Dorset's Legal and Civic Service in Branksome, a Bournemouth University graduation ceremony, the two-minute silence at 11am on the 11th of the 11th, a visit to the minesweeper on Paul Key with the Admiral of the Port boarding um, ceremony, the service of remembrance in Paul Park, complete with its unfortunate hiccup or two, and a series of Christmas lights events and carol services. Of note was a trip with the Mayor of Bournemouth and Christchurch to St Martin's in the Field to an Admiralty carol concert and a light up a life with the Sheriff in aid of the Forest Home, normally held at Paul Civic Centre, but for obvious reasons held elsewhere, in this case at, Long, at the Long Barrow in Lichet. We also enjoyed witnessing a baby glue graduation event at the Bourne Hub, this is a fascinating concept where babies with their mums and dads enjoy some live music, dancing and songs. It works, they were transfixed by the whole thing, parents and all, with barely a hint of stroppiness from the little ones. One to try at home. We also attended the opening of the visitor centre at Upton Country Park. We had a three-week hiatus over Christmas where nothing happened involving the Paul Mayor, whereas in the past, the Mayor would have been involved on Christmas Day years ago saying hello to the lonely and isolated at Talbot Combined School, long since ended as a tradition, and more recently, I'm told until about six years ago, serving lunch with the Salvation Army in Paul. Since Christmas, we've, att we we've attended a presentation of grants at Hall and Woodhouse in Blantford, alongside the Mayor of Bournemouth and the Chairman of BCP Council. A joint event with the Bournemouth Mayor where we received individual gifts as a thank you from the Dorset Nigerian Ghanaian Igbo uh, community. The opening of an exhibition of art from mainly the 1930s by the East London Dorset Group. And last Saturday attended an aptly named panto, Freezing loosely based on the film Frozen by Broadstone Pantomime Productions. And sadly, of course, the funeral of former Mayor Les Burden. Very unexpected, as it was just a few weeks ago that I was sat alongside Les at a lunch organised by the Society for Paul. Another recent event, alongside the Chairman of BCB Council and the Mayor of Bournemouth, was to greet two potential investors from India in the BCP area. Those involved thought it was so well received that the format could well be repeated in the future. In conclusion, the role of um, charter mayors within BCP is evolving and hopefully can be restored to the kind of prominence the old borough mayor had for so many years. I really hope the Civic Working Party can rise to the new challenges and make sure that the mayor and sheriff of Paul and the Charter Trust has a significant role in promoting our town and making it the important and significant party um, partner in the future, as well as celebrating our past. Thank you. Slightly over long, a little bit disjointed, but uh, that's what happens when you run out of time to edit something. <laughs> um, right, I think we're on to agenda item five. Um, Update on the intentions for the historic and listed Paul Civic Centre. Um, I'm going to ask um, Drew. Well, if, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if if Drew can do the introduction, then um, we will be. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so uh, appreciate the opportunity to, be, to come today and, uh, and, and to talk about this. And um, we've got we're, um, Craig Beavers, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Future Places and much closer to, to, the, to the project with us as well. Um, at, at the very high level, what we wanted to do, um, you know, there, there was a, a, a plan around the coroner um, and uh, then looking to do some, you know, coming into the, to the, 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 what you call the uh, retained slice effectively. Um, we're actually, you know, when we said, look, if you're going to put a team like Future Places together which we're able to do um, then it, it's worth pausing and checking you know that's the right right option so we did that um, with the uh, with the civic center and another number of uh, the, the key sites and projects 
um, they were able to look at it and and, and come up with um, some other other options which we which we tested. Uh, Craig's happy to talk you through them, um, and I'm you know obviously here if we uh, any questions or comments for for me as well, uh, Chair. But I'm really pleased where we're getting to. There is a, um, a uh, effectively a report coming through um, a, a council for to, to be signed off, um, so that'll be available shortly. But for the time being, we've got we've got a verbal update for you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Craig. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, I think I've met quite a few of you. I'm Craig Beavers. I'm Chief Operating Officer of BCP Future Places. Um, as you probably know, we've been in place for about a year now, and um, Paul Civic Centre was one of an initial batch of projects that we've been working up to, to bring to council. Um, it's fair to say that it's uh, a building that's had a lot of work done, it by, done on it by various groups um, around the council. Um, in particular, as Drew mentioned, there's been the work uh, around whether an appropriate use is to put the coroner's service into the building and then find another use for the rest of it. Um, the conclusion that we came to was that that was quite problematic for a number of reasons. Um, not least, it's a, a much-loved building and it's very beautiful. Um, putting a coroner's service into it would almost inevitably mean some pulling about and whether you'd be able to preserve the uh, historic fabric would be, would be quite difficult. Um, there's also the issue around the, the civic uses. You, you, you know, the pool charter trustees, the mayoralty and various other entities use the, um, the building and is that really necessary compatible with grieving relatives and um, the functions of a coroner's court going on? Um, and then finally is what do you do with the rest of it? Um, there is a proposal, as I think people will be aware, to uh, convert the, the arms, for want of a better word, of the building into residential. Um, and that's really quite difficult. Um, it's, you know, the building's listed in, in parts at the front. Um, it's certainly beautiful throughout. How do you get access into that without either cutting new openings or, you know, manipulating it around? And then finally, just the configuration of the arms. It, the the structure is quite interesting. The outside walls and the roof are all solid, and everything else is movable partitions. Um, you know, sound transmission is going to be an issue unless you spend an awful lot of money on breaking those up. Heat retention is an issue, and also, you know, very very long corridors with just one point of entry at either end becomes quite hard in a, a residential setting. It's probably worth saying, you know, at the outset, it's one of the cases that always needs to be considered that doing nothing is just not an option. Um, it, the, the building, unfortunately, has a, a lot of catch-up capex that's required. Um, estimates by the quantity surveyors that looked at it suggest that could be as much as £11 million. Pounds. To leave that building sitting there doing nothing but with an £11 million pound liability is you know, not best use of the, the building. So what are the other options? Well, an obvious one is sell it. Um, I, th I think that's something that for, you know, the people in this room and people in the community really don't want to embrace. We absolutely understand that. Um, there's certainly the risk that if you sell it, if not immediately, at some point in the future, somebody may apply to demolish it. If you've lost control of it, it's harder to, uh, to deal with those. Admittedly, the listed part would remain, but what happens with the rest of the site? Reletting it as offices. Um, I know there's been work by council teams to, to look at that, and that's um, been discounted. You need to do an expensive refurbishment before you can do anything. And the, the rent that you would command on that building is, is just not enough to justify that on economic grounds. Um, so what else can you do with it? Well, if you just look at the building and its structure, one of the, the things that's quite striking is actually it lends itself quite nicely to a hotel. You've got a, a fantastic facade. You've got some beautiful public rooms immediately inside the entrance. And then you've got long arms leading off it. Well, what is a hotel if it's not a building with a central corridor and rooms leading off either side? We wanted to test that. We ran a soft marketing exercise uh, last year. We put out uh, through some um, hope a specialist firm's hotel agent to request for um, expressions of interest. And we got 26 expressions of interest back. I mean, we, we were absolutely blown away by the, um, the level of interest and the quality um, of operators that were, were looking um, at, at um, working with us. Among that group, it's, it, you know, it's on a non-binding and early-stage basis, but six people put together very detailed proposals. Um, you know, the, these are people that spent their own money on working up uh, you know, schemes. 
room layouts, that kind of thing. Um, and so the, you know, the question became, can we keep the things that are important to pool and yet still deliver a quality hotel? Obviously, there's the, the civic access, the mayoralty, um, the mayor's parlour, the council chamber, um, and the, you know, the rooms below. And the message that came back was, we, we don't see that as a workaround. That's something we actively want. Um, you know, the hotel operators you know, said, look, you, know, you have a civic function. The first thing all those people do when it finishes is either go to the restaurant or go to the bar. The, it works for everybody. So that's a, a tick in the box. Um, there's the issue around what kind of hotel you provide. You know, the, the, the budget hotel operators, if, if the world were interested, well, pool's quite well served with those kind of things. And there's no regenerative benefit to putting those in. What becomes interesting is the, the, the higher quality offerings, uh, of which we had a number of, um, uh, of expressions of interest. Um, and the, the, the comment that they made was that you've got a, a community that's well served at the, the budget end, but it's not well served at the destination end. You know, something that people are actually going to have a reason to come to pool, to visit, to stay in these hotels, and to serve you know, a slightly different underserved um, kind of visitor. The, be the advantage of those kind of operators is they bring investment into things like the gym and the spa and the restaurants that, you know, perhaps the community would use for weddings and, and events. So that's something that we think is definitely worth um, exploring and that we're working up. So the proposal that's coming to council um, is that we uh, continue to work beyond an outline business case to a full business case to convert the building into a high quality hotel. There's a number of delivery options that are available. One is that the um, council funds the, uh, the conversion, um, owns the building, and then contracts with a, a, a hotel operator, somebody that's ex expert and branded operator that you know, would be recognized in the marketplace to provide the services to the council. Um, obviously the advantages of that is that the, the council maintains 100% control of the asset. Um, the disadvantage is it's got to fund it, and it's it's expensive. It, you know we can't get away from that. Building a a big high quality hotel somewhere between 150 and 180 rooms, depending on which operator in the configuration, is is not a cheap thing to do. Um, there are other options. There are people out there that would be interested in entering into leases. It's probably more complicated than we've got time to go into now, but broadly. We contract with a, another party to do the work for us. The council owns the freehold. Um, a pension fund or some other investor would, would contribute the money uh, under a lease arrangement and then uh, operate the hotel. The advantage of that is much less um, investment for the council. Um, times are, are, are not the easiest for finding investment money. Um, and you can keep the access and you can keep the um, civic functions under, under contractual arrangement. And that's something that you know, we've, we've explored um, at this stage and is, is available to the council if it's something that it wants to go um, further with. Probably one of the things that's worth thinking about in the context of all of this is what you do with the rest of that campus. Obviously, it's a, a big old piece of land. Um, there's the uh, town centre annex, which I have a particular affection for because it was the first home of future places. Um, leaky ceilings and all, we actually quite enjoyed our stay there. It was a, it was a good place to, to be, and it was a pressure cooker to get the company going. Um, but it's it's at the end of its life. The, there's no value in retaining that building. It's it's beyond um, economic repair, and it's not a configuration. And it's uh, given everything else around the site. It's something that would lend itself very well to delivery of further housing. Um, that's what we are working up. The proposal that we're putting to council. Um, would show 386 new homes across that campus. Um, and we, we think that's something that the, the area very desperately needs and it's a good place to put it. One of the things that's intriguing, we've, we've done quite a lot of work on looking at what happens when you put a, a, a good quality hotel in. And it tends to act as a, a regenerative catalyst. The whole area tends to trade up. Um, we've seen multiple examples of this. We've had consultants look at this for us. Um, and it, it, you know, just in terms of getting footfall into the area and value for property, it's a, it's a driver. And we don't think that should be discounted. That land is owned by BCP Council. Any benefit of the value of that land flows to the council that can then use for, for other things within the area. Um, and that's something that we will be working with council colleagues and, 
uh, council members to um, to further the understanding of that as we go forwards. I think in the interest of time, if I may, I'll leave it there. Um, if you've got questions, I'd be delighted to try and answer them. And you know, one thing that we future places always say when we're at these meetings, we are always happy to engage with elected members and with members of the community. You know, if you have questions, if you've got thoughts on the things we're doing, you know, we're here. Please come and talk to us. We we don't view our role as being telling BCP what it should be. Our role is to listen to what you think it should be and then deliver it. And we delighted to try and work with you to deliver that. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call for questions, see if I can ask a question myself. What is the likely time scale of this exercise? It's a good question. So um, where we are at the moment is we have a, a concept paper that's coming to council for council to make a decision on. Um, if that's accepted, it will take probably in the region of a year to finalise design working with a partner because obviously whichever operating partner we go with, they all have slightly different uh, designs for you know what they would want and how many rooms and configurations, things like that. There's then the planning process to go through um, and then you've got a build phase and uh, our best understanding at this stage, which you know is relatively early, is that it's a two-year build programme. Right, thank you. Um, questions? Um, Vicky. Thank, thank you. I've got a couple of questions um, related to the halo effect. I'm absolutely comfortable with the idea of a halo effect. I'm interested in your thoughts about the... You clearly have talked about it needing to be a high class, high quality hotel rather than a, you know, entry level travel lodge type thing, um, which uh, the building, you know, demands. Um, but how do you square people arriving in their, you know, in their Teslas and their Audi TTs for a luxury weekend in a with a spa? Um, and the need for us to actually use the rest of the site for affordable housing because it sounds to me as if that, that's not, they're not conducive to each other. It's not an area that's a, a highly desirable area. It's a lovely area, but it's not an area where you know, those two are going to match. I, I'm struggling to understand that. Thank you. Um, it's a fair question. The, what I would say to you is you know, we've had these operators down on site. They are people that are expert in operating these kind of hotels. Um, the thing that they are all extremely excited about is the location opposite Pool Park and the entry across to the park. You know, if you think about Dublin's a good example, you have a lot of hotels there that are very elegant hotels opposite good quality public space. As long as it's got its own access point and its own parking, which the, the Civic Centre is very well um, served by, you know, it's, it's not that far from the beaches, all those kind of things. Um, that's the thing that's interesting them. So that's, that's the first part of the, the answer. The second part is what do you do with the housing? I'm not sure that it's, it's necessarily the best thing to do to build affordable all the way across that site. I think it really needs to be a true mixed-use, multi-level community. Um, if you build affordable all the way across, it's expensive to build. You don't recognise value, best value out of the site and the halo effect. So isn't it a better option to extract value from the bits closest to the hotel and then use the money that you generate from those to build more affordable. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. Thanks for your honesty, Craig. Um, but, you know, that's, that's exactly what I was expecting to hear. Where are we going to put the poor people who can't afford the luxury flats? So I'm, th that's the problem I've got with it, is... It's a council site. We should be using it primarily to help people here not to build more expensive flats. Um, the other major issue I've got with this is risk. Um, the council is risk to its eyeballs already. You said something like £150 million to, to do this. Um, you know, that presumably is more debt. Um, that's all risk for the council. So you're either saying either we take on £150 million of extra debt or we partner with somebody, and if we partner with somebody, presumably they're going to take some of the asset value. So uh, 
I, this is just piling debt on debt, isn't it? I'm, I'm, why? And the third thing I want to ask is, you're talking about coming forward with a concept. Um, we had a presentation months ago, and it doesn't sound like things have moved any further forward. So what's been going on in the last few months since we had the presentation? And when we had the presentation, actually, there wasn't an awful lot of new stuff that we heard. So I'm just concerned about why we've got only this far after a year. And, uh, you know, what, what, what's the next six months going to bring? Because I just can't see it. I just don't think this is viable. I think we're just wasting time and we should be focusing on other projects. Yeah, I, I think I think I think it makes sense for for me to come first, you know, uh, and uh, you know through for you, Mr. Mayor. But this is this is a charge trustees in terms of what BCP Council would like to do with this in terms of risk analysis is exactly what we'll be doing by taking it through, um, and 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 looking at the the full business case on it. We've we've got a very you know eloquent presentation of of what we can do with that site, which respects the what the charter trustees you know um, uh, and and many people I've spoken to members I've spoken to will want out of the site, maximising the site. You know, um, I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, give my opinion uh, in terms of, you know, council stakes. I think that's not for this meeting. It's for it's for, for future, you know, future BCB council meetings. But um, perhaps we could stick to, uh, you know, the, the, the presentation of what we actually can potentially use that site for and take feedback in terms of what the Charter Trustees would like to see um, uh, for that site and their, their use of it, Chair, um, Mr Mayor. Yeah, before I call the Deputy Mayor who's asked to speak in this, you've still got s something you need to say, Craig? No. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously from the Charter Trustees' point of view, it's all about having a base. And I know from my experience over the last six, nine months or whatever, that it is very, very difficult to operate as Mayor without a base without anywhere where you can entertain people. And, um, you know, it is, it is certainly a serious disadvantage at the moment. And um, when I um, have attended joint events, and I've referred to a couple in Bournemouth Town Hall, it, it's actually very embarrassing mm -hmm. to be um, a representative of Paul that has absolutely nothing to Stand. offer in the table. But... I'll, I'll, I'll call the, def the Deputy Mayor next, who will no doubt have... Thank you, Chair. Um, my question was to Craig, really. Um, thank you for that. It was, re it was really nice, really good. And I am looking forward to the full project. Um, I didn't hear anything about parking in reality. So that's always a bugbear of mine. So do you have any idea on where parking would be on that site, be it for the for the housing, the housing part or the hotel part, because 180 rooms or whatever, that's a lot of vehicles, no matter which way you look at it. So, and it's on a roundabout. So I'm just thinking, I throw that question out all the time, so. Yeah, I, I have some slides, but unfortunately I can't show okay. them to you. I'm very happy to show you um, That afterwards. would be brilliant. Um, yes, there is provision for parking, and we've worked very closely with parking colleagues within the council to make sure that the, the provision is Thank you, and that will, sorry, that will cover the mayoralty parties and everything else, yes? There'll be parking for the mayor and the sheriff. Uh, I haven't got a specific answer to that, but okay. I would imagine, so I'll certainly get you an answer and check. That, that's cool, that's cool, thank you very much. Hopefully the answer, answer is yes. Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen Daniel signal. Yes. And I can see a hand in the back, but I can't thank, identify thank you, thank the you. owner of that um, hand. Thank you, Greg, for the, the, the update on, on this and, and the fact that we were going to have a coroner's court. Now that's changed and everything. With the current condition of the building, uh, has anything changed since we've closed Civic Centre? And is there any way to reopen it so Mr Mayor can have his regalia talks and obviously we can have our meetings within the chamber? Is that possible? And is it possible to open up the cast stock room below so that can be used for communities as well? I know. Yeah. 
uh, thank you. I mean, there, there, there are, you know, so probably Matt might, uh, Mr. Philbin might have, an, uh, there are issues in terms of opening up in terms of uh, business rates and uh, uh, effectively, so that's one of the reasons why we, we needed to close it. So there would be a cost to that. I was not saying we, we, we can't do that and can't look at that. And taking on, uh, you know, the, the mayor's point, I think one thing we absolutely have to do um, and, and should have done more this year um, uh, is, is work out what uh, meanwhile um, options are in terms of, you know, basing the mayoralty. Um, I know we've looked, uh, you know, we, we, we're here partially, we've, we've got opportunity around the Guildhall. I think it'd be really useful in that interim space um, to, to, to do more on that. And it could be partly looking at whether we could, in, in, the, in, when that, in the year that it's not being built, um, whether we can open up a bit, but there are financial costs to, to doing that. Um, but if we want to do that, that, we can have a discussion about that as a as a as a council group. Not sure if any of the officers um, would want to comment on that. Uh, otherwise, but had to say about the cost. Thank you. Okay. Hope the um, chief executive or our clerk. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, just to comment that you know the building is closed. The the utilities have been switched off. It's cold. The furniture isn't there anymore. So it would be a major undertaking to reopen it, as, as the leader has said, physically capable of doing that, but it would be a major cost. And to be honest, the number of hours for which it would be used would make that quite an expensive per hourly uh, cost for doing it, because the furniture would need to be back there, we'd need to heat it, et cetera. Um, so I think it's, it's very difficult to do that and difficult, because we aren't able to separate parts of the, the, the building off. Um, so my advice would be we could, but uh, it's probably too expensive to do that. I do think we've got options around the Guildhall. We will have options around the museum when that reopens, uh, Scotland's Court. So my sense would be looking at some of those historical buildings as a more, um, more attractive intermediate option. Interim even. <laughs> Thank you. I think I saw Felicity's hand next. Oh, this. Um, yeah, Felicity first, and then I think Mark. And I'm not sure whether... Did you signal Sean? Yeah, I'll be Felicity, Mark, and then Sean. Hello. Um, yeah, I've I've heard of. Um, I'm I'm not convinced by the social value of a high class hotel. Um, so um, I, I've heard of things like a high class museum or a high class um, sporting facility that is for the public use. Um, and for anybody within the public to be able to use. Um, so so um, if you've got any evidence that you can pass on to us about um, how that improves social value in the area. Um, but what I would particularly um, wonder whether we as Charter Trustees could ask um, is for a, a proper social value assessment um, of, of your proposal um, with also a comparison, for example, of having um, social housing on the whole site, um, the social value of that. Um, because we often underestimate the social value of um, social housing. And it is our land. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take that in, in two bits? Um, the, the first one is the value of putting housing on the whole site. Um, as you might remember, there was a scheme that was worked up by the council before Future Places got involved looking at this. And as I mentioned briefly, converting the civic centre building itself into housing is really, really difficult. Um, the housing team managed to get 16 units out of it. You know, when you think about the size of the footprint, the m amount of wasted space that you use in corridors becomes very, very difficult. Um, if you think about the council chambers, I don't see how those could be used for for housing, you know, you need to find a purpose for those that will respect them and ensure that they're looked after and maintained and, you know, are available for um, for civic uses. You know, it arguably becomes difficult if you've got dwellings all the way around the, the rest of that and people that can migrate around that with no staff or supervision. Um, and uh, the, the question of sports and things, um, you know, it's not really a question of everything going on to every site. Future Places is looking at sports provision, I, I think you're probably aware. Um, one of the things that we're, we're looking at is the, the Dolphin Centre at the moment, and we're looking at other sports facilities around the area and whether they should be reprovided on the same spot or somewhere else. So it, it, please don't think that this is about discounting sport and, and other social activities. We, we absolutely agree that those are needed, but it's a case of you know right asset in right place. Um, certainly there's a need for housing, but it's got to be we've got to be pragmatic. It's got to be paid for. 
you know, I'm, I'm sure that you, you people spend an awful lot of time thinking about how anything can be made viable and can be paid for. And to, to Vicky's point, it's, it's the same point, isn't it? You, you know, is this the, the best use for the site to put housing on it? Well, we've got to generate some money to pay for the housing that we do build. And if that means that it's got to be a mix, that's one of the proposals we're making to you. Ultimately, it's not our decision. You know, if, if you as elected members decide that you want affordable across the whole site, that's fine, but there's a cost to that. Yeah, we d um, you, you got a supplementary, yeah. Um, just, just to point out, we're drifting dangerously close to having a BCP-type discussion rather than the Charter Trust discussion because um, our main priority is obviously the heritage and the tradition and the functioning of the Charter Trustee, but um, I think you want a supplementary felicity, then it's Mark. Yeah, you didn't really answer the question about the social value and whether um, there's been any assessment of that. Um, and obviously, as Ch Charter Trustees, I would have thought that's something that we could request to BCP Council, I suppose. Certainly, we can take that to and discuss it with Council colleagues, but yeah, if that's, if that's a separate piece of work. Uh, we, well, we've, we've looked at, uh, you know, as I say, we are looking at a range of these social assets across a, a, a range of sites. So, you know, if the question, uh, I'm not quite sure the question you're asking. If the question is, are we considering social assets all the way across the piece? Yes, we absolutely are. Um, thank you. Um, I can't really see it's a site for a high-quality hotel. I think people need to be near the water for that. But I can see a mid-range hotel there. The pool does need more mid-range hotels. So, you know, in theory, it's a, it's a possibility. But what I would really be concerned about is that, you know, ho if you haven't got a branded hotel chain that is going to run your hotel you're in a disaster area because they're really difficult things to run if you don't, you know, if, if you don't have all the systems in place that these 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 chains have. And therefore, you know, it's I would say it's essential it, for the chain that comes in to uh, basically commit to do all the renovation works that delivers the hotel and and that the, the council isn't left on the hook isn't putting capital investment into that because if the hotel chain can walk away uh, and we're left with a redundant hotel that that's an absolute that's an absolute disaster for the council so and I on on the social value point you know it, it, it's I think it's really important I've said all the way along that we need to you know a community room there that can be used in that area because there isn't isn't really a good quality one for local people to use in that area. Um, so I think that's a real priority. Thank you. Yep. Just to um, keep it moving, because I'm rather conscious of the time, can we have perhaps the next two questions and then go back to um, Craig. Craig then? Um, so I think Sean was the next one. You're okay, are you? Sure. Um, Karen, is your bit relevant to this, Karen? Is my bit relevant to this particular line of discussion? Number two, yes. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, Karen. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Craig, for that presentation. And uh, and I have to say, I'm surprised by some of the negativity in the room because for me, it takes all my boxes. It retains that historical aspect of that beautiful building. And I know it really well because I worked there for the council for years before I was even elected. Uh, and I love the building and I would hate to see it um, be, be, be sold off or, or you know, um, something happen to it that didn't retain it in partly in our ownership. Um, I like the idea of a flagship hotel. I think that's absolutely what Pool needs. And, and I can think of many people who would say, oh yeah, I really actually quite fancy staying in that hotel, looking over the beautiful park. Um, you know what I'm gonna say, Craig, probably, when you're considering the housing, consider extra care. <laughs> it's, well, as I think you know, it's, it's a community thing, we have, we have an equal investment in uh, Conway. Yeah, so it's, that's, it's, 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 it's absolutely, absolutely um, 
on, on the radar for that. That's great. Thank you very much. Right. Um, again, trying to move it along. David. Going to do David, then um, Diana, and then the Deputy Mayor was going to ask a question, which I think will sum it up quite nicely. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, my main question is, it's been talked about just the Civic Centre site, but also the wider um, area around the Civic Centre, the other buildings and the car park areas, etc. Um, and we've all probably got different views on different uses, but at what stage in the process of developing um, proposals for the Civic Centre site and the wider site around there, are we going to have any stakeholder engagement or community engagement with the public? Because uh, we're sat here as Charter Trustees, we're stakeholders, there's other stakeholders around that site, the college, the Friends of Paul Park, the residents in the residential that's already on that site, you know, I think there's a lot of people who would be interested in what proposals there are for that site and I'd like to see some engagement so that we can not only come up with something that satisfies the Charter Trustees, works financially, but also satisfies the wider community and the wider interests. Right, thank you. Um, we'll have Diana, <laughs> then the Deputy Mayor, and then get Craig and um, Drew can sort of sum up, and then we will move on. Thank you. Yes, I also was going to ask about consultation because um, the public need to be asked about this, and considering the number of years it's going to take to fruition, um, you know, we're going to have plenty of time um, before anything's started. The other thing is insulation. Nobody has ever slept overnight in that building, and you've got traffic going all the way around. Um, I mean, my ideas were to use it for day um, provision of whatever. Um, if you're going to be there overnight, you're going to need a lot of insulation for sound and um, that will be quite a lot of expense and, and design, I would imagine. And, and the fact that the whole building is listed, it's not just a certain little bit of it, it's the whole building. Um, perhaps instead of housing, we could have provision of facilities to go with it and also public use rather than uh, all housing. And that would fit in with your other plans uh, for future places to look at other provisions, you know, like sports, have, have it in the bit that you're looking to build on, have it as part of that, which would be a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you. And the um, phantom footsteps, which I've actually heard when everyone else has left the building, um, that is quite, quite sort of strange. Um, Deputy Mayor, and then... Um Thank you, um, Mr Mayor. My question is, because I was listening to Drew, and I do really think this is a good idea. I think your plan is, is really good, I do. Um, but when I was listening to Drew and, and Dan but asked you the question about could we get the civic building open again for, for the mayor, etc., and you kind of come across positive, and then Graham was asked the same question, and it came as a negative. So is it possible for us to have a true costings of the, for the opening of the civic centre again, so as the mayoral parties, etc., can use it because for me empty buildings die and the worst thing that can be done for that building is leaving it empty we need life back in it so i'd just like to know if we can have costings on that please yes perfect right um drew and craig between you Got anything to say before we move on? I'll, I'll just say that it's the most I've ever felt like a politician when somebody said that I gave a positive answer and Graham gave a negative one. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, uh, it, uh, effectively, you know, we, we, we can. All I was trying to say is it's, it's in our gift. We can do it if we want to, but there's a cost. Let's, let's work out what the cost is. I think what I would suggest is alongside that, we do a proper piece of work about for the next, you know, two years, um, two to three years potentially, I think was, was Craig's sort of time scale. Um, we understand what we can do that's better than we've done now for, for, for the mayor. Because I completely agree with you, uh, Mr. Mayor. We need to we need to do that. So, so yes, we will look into that costing and bring it back. Um, and we will also um, support in any way we can what our other options are for the next for the next three years. Other than that, I think you know the, the, the questions were, were probably to Craig. So um, perhaps Craig, but before I hand back, and I thank you for the uh, details you've given us for the, the really excellent work that's gone in over the last year to get to a situation that 
won't just respect that building, um, but will also give, give real benefit to um, to uh, Paul as a whole and BCP uh, as as well. So uh, so thank you, thank you for that. <coughs> Thanks very much. I mean, certainly, it's it's been really interesting to to hear your comments. Um, if I can just deal with a couple of them, and if I've missed any, um, uh, apologies. You know, maybe we can catch up at the end or something. To your point on um, insulation and structure, I, I didn't want to go into every last detail of what the work we've done because it would have taken forever. And to Vicky's point, you know, there's been a lot going on, particularly around the structural work, insulation, refurbishment. Um, if I tell you that every window in that building would have to be replaced almost irrespective of use. Um, as you're probably aware, there are new um, regulations coming in around energy efficiency of office buildings, that kind of thing. That work needs to be done. The, 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 you know, the, as I said, we've had six detailed expressions of interest. These weren't just somebody driving past and saying, oh yeah, it's a good idea. You know, there have been architects, there have been structural engineers, there have been quantity surveyors all the way through there. You know, several of them have said that the, their specification would involve triple glazed argon filled glass. I don't know if you've ever come across that, but I mean, it's, it, it is totally sound insulating. The, the brickwork is actually very, very good. Um, that's not an issue. The roof space, I've, I've been up there and I've crawled around it myself. Um, there's a lot of room up there. Some of the operators are interested in creating um, inward looking um, mansard extensions to, to increase room capacity, you know, leaving the external um, facades as is. Um, they've looked at whether that could be sufficiently insulated to produce you know, an energy efficient um, building and the, the answer they tell us is yes. Um, so those are all things that are, you know, we're at feasibility stage, none of this is final, but the, you know, the indications are good. A, a good quality energy efficient building can be done. Um, to Mark's comment, you know, it's, a, it's an absolutely fair comment, what's the right point in the market to put this? What I would say is that you've got some, uh, unfortunately, we're in confidentiality with them at the moment, but I can uh, tell you in a public forum that there are some of the most respected hotel operators in the UK that have walked that building. They're prepared to put their name to it and put their money to it. They understand that it's a, it will work as a quality hotel and they wouldn't put their money into it if they didn't. Um, in terms of who do you partner with, absolutely take your point, but it's got to be a quality operator with sufficient strength to be able to do it because the council doesn't want to get left with a building that it can't operate. This is not something that we're looking at put building our own brand around. It would only be done with the right quality operator and the right step in rights if they fail. That's uh, absolutely key to um, the commercial considerations. Um, consultation. Sorry? Consultation. Consulta sorry, consultation. Yeah, as I, I think many of you are aware, we run extensive consultation programs around the uh, the projects that we're doing when they reach a stage where there's sufficient detail to go out and speak. I think a number of you have been at our Pool P consultations and uh, around the Boston consultations and a couple of the others. Um, it is absolutely something that we'll be consulting with the, the local community on. Um, and, you know, we welcome comments from stakeholders. We've, we've had a number already. Um, you know, as I said, please come and talk to us. That's something that we want to do and we will be running a formal process on that as we go forward to the next stage. Yeah. Well, thank you, Drew. Thank you, Craig. I think it was useful to have this discussion because the, um, the Pool Civic Centre is core to the activities of the Charter Trustees and the morality, and it does need to be looked at. And um, just one tip, if you leave before the end of the meeting, don't get mugged by a squirrel in the dark woodland. <laughs> it is dark. <laughs> um, Right. Right. Agenda uh, six. item six: Report of the Civic Working Group. Um, Mike Brook. Fine. Thank Shall you. I say the sheriff. No, it's all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the Civic Party Working Group met on the. I've got it down. Here on the nineteenth of, of December and covered a very wi wide variety of. Um, issues and topics. The, if you've read the report, the first one of those was the civic events matrix and a joint meeting has been held uh, just a couple of days or so ago and there will be a report coming out later on the, the conclusions from that. Um, civic flag, very contentious as always. Um, 
at the end of the meeting where we discussed the design of the civic flag, the agreed flag uh, raised certain uh, levels of confusion with some members of the Charter Trustees, and there were lots of correspondence f uh, following that. Um, what has been happened, and you'll see that there is a design um, in this, in your report, which was the one that was actually agreed at the Charter Trustees. And the recommendation from the Civic Working Party is that that flag is taken forward and, and discussions with the printers to refine the detail of it. Um, and so that is to delegate all further matters relating to the pool flag to the working group. Um, can I just see if everyone's happy with that particular recommendation? Good. It looks like that, that one's okay. Um, annual mayor making and the accommodation for the Charter Trustees took a significant amount of time. And that's in paragraphs six and seven. And out of that were four recommendations. I'll come back to that in a minute or two because I think we can move on to the other items very quickly because there will be, I imagine, quite a bit of debate on the uh, recommendations and I'll explain how we're going to take, take that forward. There were discussions around the beating of the sea bounds and this reflects very much the responsibility of the Charter Trustees in preserving the heritage and traditions and this is the a long-standing tradition that um, sadly died uh, a few years ago, but the P Society of Pool are wanting to um, reinstate that um, event and tie it in with the Harry Pay ev event as well. Um, I gather, LJ, you wanted to say a few words about that. So if I can hand, hand over to you just for, to deal with that very briefly, because it is it's su suggested that a member of the Charter Trustees can actually sit on the meetings of the Society of Pool while those discussions and things go on. It would be for 2024. Thank you, Mike. Yes, I've literally only just heard about this, but um, basically Beating of the Sea Bounds is a um, traditional part of Pool's maritime heritage um, about showing where our actual boundaries are. Uh, there used to be apparently quite a lot of... Um, arguments over this, particularly with the burghers of Wareham. So the idea was that the boats went round with some drums and beat them at our boundaries to show exactly where they were. Um, and this has gone on since pretty much the 17th century. Unfortunately, the event has fallen into um, a bit of disuse, so it's something that the Society of Pool are very interested in bringing back. And I think um, as part of our Pool Charter Trustees uh, um, purpose is to um, help promote these sort of cultural and historic events. I'd really like to propose a motion that we work um, closely with the Society of Pool um, in bringing back this event and um, looking at funding and all the other options. May I have a second there, please? Oh, just to say, I can also send round um, the history behind it, which uh, the Society of Pool Chairmen's put together, explaining it a lot better than I have just then. Fine. Thank you, LJ. Um, so we've got a motion um, to be involved with that development. Anyone wish to um, speak? Julie, do you want to? Thank you. Thank you. All I was going to say was that I know when I was the mayor, um, there was a lot of talk about doing the beating of the bounds, and I can remember Carol Evans was the last person I saw doing it, and it was really well attended in Hanworthy, so I'm thinking it will be again, and it's good for Paul, so thank you. I can tell you that uh, 2018, I was the consort to the mayor who did organize it. There's never been a barrier to organizing it. We've only lacked an individual to organize it. So any mayor could have organized it. 
anybody from the uh, historical society could organize it. I mean, it's not a, it's not it's somebody rolling up the sleeves and just putting it together. The the boundaries are are marked on. They got little markers. They're well known. There's books. They're documented. It's not a big event to to organize or host. Okay, fine. Thank you. Is there any, anyone else? Tony? Yeah, if Mr. I can Mayor. come in, because um, as I say, um, did have a conversation with the Society of Paul when they um, organized a lunch to um, Mecklenburg honorary president or um, whatever. And um, they are talking about an event in, in or around June, July 2024. And I'm going to make a suggestion, a little bit random off the cuff, that the sheriff-elect, who would effectively be mayor in June or July 2024, um, should be our representative on that committee if everything, you know, follows accordingly. And... All um, oh, right. <laughs> There appears to be two seconders out there. So is everyone happy with um, that? No dissent. I can't see any dissent, so um, right. We can move on a bit. Okay. Um, so apart from those agreements, it was agreed that further information be provided to the trustees at a future date. So we look forward to seeing that report from, or the detailed historical account from the chairman of the Society of Pool. Um, it says here, any other business for that, for that meeting? Uh, marking the coronation, it was suggested that we put £10,000 on one side for the Charter Trustees to arrange events or support local um, events that uh, residents might want to do for the, current, for the coronation. And I can confirm that the Bournemouth Charter Trustees agreed £10,000 uh, just, I think, yesterday or Monday, um, so it seems to be a, a, a set figure, and bearing in mind the budget balance that we have, it would be a sensible um, thing to do. So, again, the recommendation that the chart and uh, coming out of that, and I will ask if everyone's happy with that, that, that the Charter Trustees agree to delegate authority to the Civic Working Group to determine the use of the budget, on the assumption that you're agreeable to that that figure as a budget to set aside for the coronation. Any dissenters? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All. Yeah, yeah. Because I'll. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
for that weekend. And, um, you know, I hope that the um, Civic Working Group can um, meet in the not too distant future to um, look at perhaps some of the detail of that. Okay, fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Diane? Diane? Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask if it's going to be delegated to the, um, the group, um, would they bring forward suggestions to all the Charter Trustees uh, before deciding on what's going to be included in the coronation events? And the other question is, um, 10,000 sounds quite a lot of money compared to possibly what we spent on the Queen's Jubilee. Um, if I'm right in looking at the budget, that might have been about under 5,000, but I might be wrong. But um, that's just what struck me, 10,000. Um, I wondered if that's a little too much. I don't know. Thank you. In answer to your first question, I'm sure that w any suggestions that, that are f um, certainly from, for th from the civic group will go forward to the Charter Trustees to, to be aware of and make comment on and perhaps even either veto or support. Um, th thank you. Um, in terms of the amount, uh, I'm afraid, I think we said it, I said it at the time, I thought what we spent on the Jubilee was inadequate. So to compare it to the Jubilee, which, you know, the coronation I would like to think is less frequent than a, a Jubilee, um, although I recognise the 70th was a big one. I think we need to make a really positive impact with this. I think um, what we didn't do last year was more noticeable than what we did. So I would like to see us do a bit more. I am a bit worried about the fact that I don't know if there are any further Charter Trustee meetings between now and the Jubilee for, for people to engage with. So how can we make sure that um, com the communities of Paul, which are all represented by the Charter Trustees, have got the opportunity to get involved with whatever the main event is, uh, and that all the Charter Trustees have got a stake in this? Yeah, Graham's wants to come in here. Thank, thank you, Mr. It was just, just to comment on the, the timing, I mean, the recommendations to delegate the, the management of the budget to the working group. I just don't think you would have time to come back to a Charter Trustees meeting of all Charter Trustees to take the decision. So. My, my sense is that if you're going to delegate it, you need to delegate it and let the working group do, do the work and make the decisions on spend. So I just wanted to be clear about that because I wasn't sure what the conclusion was of the, the earlier debate. I just wondered who was on the working group? Um, all previous serving um, mayors, current, current sheriff, and um, again, I, well, I'm inclined to propose two or three others, but um, I think this is probably not the time because it will start no, another debate. Sure, sure. But we do need to um, have these meetings and have a few more turn up than we've had at the last couple of meetings. Um, Marion and LJ showed, so if I can just hand over very quickly. Thank you. Following on from what the clerk has just said, I would suggest maybe we could do what we've done with one or two things in the past, that the working party has proposals and that they're circulated by email to all, all charter trustees um, to make comments rather than have a, a full meeting, which takes time and people tend not to come anyway. If it's by email, we might, fingers crossed, get a better response. I'm quite happy for that to, to happen. LJ? I think, um, yeah, and Karen did also indicate. Yeah, I think everyone's just really concerned about the representation of the working group and the amount of people making decisions on behalf of all charter trustees, then making decisions on behalf of the whole borough of Poole. So, um, yes, if decisions can be shared electronically um, and we all bear the burden, I think that would be much more sensible. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. And then there was the, um, moving on, there was the request from Poole Sherbrooke Twinning Association um, for an increased grant, and that is being discussed in the budget section, I believe, and that's the time when um, the four members of the twinning group will disappear for that particular bit of the budget. 
And if I can now bring you back to the accom accommodation and the mare making. The reason we've discussed co accommodation is very much that it's going to be at least th three years before we have a chance to get back into the civic center um, and therefore we need we need as has been said we need a need a home it was suggested at the working party that the guild hall would make a suitable base it's central in the center of town it's the historic um, meeting place for the former councils but clearly there are I issues with that in the same way that there are issues with being here in Upton House. Um, they would need um, electronic equipment um, vid uh, set up and there was a possibility that actually um, the trustees could work in partnership with um, the regis registrar and the events that go on there. But there would be limits in terms of time and everything else. And mare making, it was felt, would be good to take place in the Guild Hall, uh, but there have been issues over, over the dates, and we could be accommodated at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 6th of June, which I think is a different date from the one that was originally advertised. Um, I gather there may be um, alternative proposals coming forward, but if I can go through those recommendations, we will take recommendations A, B, and C together, and I'll read those out, that the charter, charter trustees consider whether they wish to hold charter trustee meetings at the Guild Hall, B, pending the outcome of A, request that officers provide further information relating to the venue and equipment costs, and C, for expediency, delegate further actions relating to the use of the Guild Hall for future meetings of the Charter Trustees to the working group. So those are the three together. Um, the main discussion will be around whether we actually wish to use the Guild Hall. At least I assume that will be the one. So I'm going to throw that open to the floor if anyone would like to yeah, comment. Just, ju just to point out, we are getting short on time. So um, perhaps we can be fairly brief on this um, and hope that too, not too many people disagree with the principle. Um, Have we compared the costs of being here in Upton compared to being at the Guild Hall and what would be better value for money? Yeah, so th through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the, the cost comparison exercise will, would be undertaken as part of uh, Recommendation B if the trustees are minded to approve that recommendation. So agree, agreeing that we might wish to meet in the Guildhall tonight is will obviously be dependent upon the costings and any other um, issues that, and clarifications that if you don't want to consider the Guildhall then you, let's say you need to say that now, otherwise I, I suspect that we will go straight through to look at the conditions around the Guildhall. Mark and then LJ. Uh, I realise I'm probably the closest councillor in, in terms of living to the, to the Guildhall, but it is a highly sustainable place unlike this. Uh, we, we're dragging everybody out here in cars, and I think we should be in the centre of town. Thank you. LJ. Thank you. Just a very quick question. Obviously, it's got those beautiful steps going up the front of the building. Is it accessible for everyone? It, it is accessible. Um, sorry, L, LJ's just questioned the accessibility of the Guildhall, bearing in mind that they've got those beautiful stairs at the, at the front. The access is at the side of the building and there is a lift. Apparently it's a very slow lift um, and it only goes up to the floor that we would, be we would be using and not beyond that. So yes, there is full accessibility. So, right. do you wish the chart the sure. to, to move forward with that as a possibility? 
I think that's a, a resounding yes. Okay, now then, bearing that in mind and the potential change of date um, for the mayor making, um, recommendation D is to consider whether the change, whether to change the date and venue of the annual mayor making meeting to Tuesday the 6th of June at the Guild Hall as opposed to presumably here on whatever date, I can't remember what the date was, Neil. Yeah, so the original date, unfortunately, can, can no longer be accommodated either oh. here or at the Guild Hall. Which, right. So, so, so we, in, in, in the light of the fact that we don't have a home for mayor making or a date, uh, I I, I personally, I would propose that we move to the 6th of June, but I would like to hear one or two comments. Yeah, if, if we can so make them brief, because we are yes. very yeah. short on time now. I, I was just going to ask if Upton House is available on that date as well, just so we can compare, because I think the robes, uh, the logistics of robes might be easier. I don't know. Thank you. So do, do, we, do we know if Upton... So well, I, I, I think we were going to go to Councillor Bagwell, um, as oh I yes. think she was going to suggest perhaps using Upton House on the, on the Tuesday. On the Tuesday, Tuesday. Yeah. right. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Um, yes, I'm to move that. I recommend that we move the mayor make into the Tuesday six as you did um, at two p.m. or eleven p.m. whichever, but to be here a.m. even. Yeah, might drive on a party at night, mind. Um, but no, sorry. So. Yes, so to propose to have the, have the mayor making here and um, there's the parking, there's the rooms. June will be beautiful outside, so it, it seems the best idea. And, um, and, I, and it isn't on a very close bus route, but it is available. So thank you. Do, do, I do, you, have a sec do you have a seconder for that? Drew? Thank you. No. Any, anyone wish to comment? Vicky. Thank you. I think there was two issues, aren't there? Because D was about there's the date and there's the place. Right. Can we clarify the date? We're all comfortable with the sixth, and that's done. So well, that that is done. So we're now agree. just debating the, the location. I think at the end of the day, what you're looking at here is going to be a, a straight, you know, a, a straight. Um, some people are going to prefer the Guildhall, some people are going to prefer here. The factor, the costs are going to be a factor. Personally, I think the Guildhall is a much more appropriate um, venue for it. Um, it can be equally beautiful there. So I, if I was going to vote, I would be voting for the Guildhall. But I don't necessarily think we want to go person by person through their vote. We just need to have a vote, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, on the assumption that there are no further further comments, I, I think. Um, well, shall we just have a show of hands mm -hmm. between the Guildhall and Upton Country House? Um, those in favour of the Guildhall, please show, and someone will have to count. That's twelve, and Upton Country House. Twelve before, so um, the guild hall is the um, what we will proceed with. Um, hopefully, that is the end of your presentation. It is indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and, for your um, comments. Move out for a short while as well. Right. Um, the one. The one suggestion I was going to throw in, actually, is that because of what is involved in the, um, in the planning of the Civic Working Group, um, I would propose that for the period up to the end of this year that we add the two budget signatories to the Civic Working Group so we can have a budget overview, and, and that will be um, Marcus Andrews and... Um, Tony O'Neill. Um, I wonder if that is something which people are quite happy with. 
because, um, you know, it gives a, it, at least it gives a financial oversight and maybe it'll make a few people feel more comfortable. Um, at this point, um, because the um, report, I think the first item on the finance report is um, the grant to um, the Paul Sherbog Twinning Association. So I think at this point, myself and the other three that are on the Twinning Association will vacate and Councillor Bagwell will take over that item. Could I just request, if other members or other charge trustees are going to use the opportunity to, to, to leave, could I just check the numbers first because we need to have 12 for the quorum, so we just need to make sure we've got well, enough. Please stay for a minute. Yeah, just, I, don't, I don't know whether just it's essential or not. But just to check. Well, we had yeah. 16. I didn't vote in the last one, so that means that we will have 13 left. If they'll stay. Yeah, so, everybody's yeah. staying. That's it. Just until check. this is done. I don't, I don't I think Councillor Mellon's going to go. Well, we'll come on. We're running out of time. We're going to be lightning, oh, you go. lightning quick. Yeah. Don't know. Let's let um, get out of the room. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Can I just? That's right. This is technical assessment. Plenty. Right. Ready? Okay. Um, where am I? I'd like to pass the meeting over to to Matthew Filmer. Thank you. Sorry for your budget report. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, recommend, recommendation A is to increase the Twinning Association grant from the current £1,500 to £4,000 for 23-24 budget. And the details of that £4,000 spend are attached on Appendix B to this report. Um, so, if all Charter Trustees are in agreement with that, we can then move on to the, the substantive budget detail. Thank you, Chair. Is every, everyone happy or is there the questions? Questions, Councillor? Uh, only just to confirm that I've checked all the numbers and understand the aspiration. Uh, and as one of the budgetary signatories, I am quite happy with the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rampton. Thank you. Just a quick question. Is this a one-off or is this ongoing that, that it's raised? For you, Madam Mayor, it's ongoing, so it'll be. It, I mean, on the assumption it's going into the base budget for um, forevermore until we review it again. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone got any more questions? Can we vote on it then? Is everybody happy? Yes? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Any dissenters or what's it? Anything? Right, perfect. Thank you. Um, Matthew, I'm introducing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So um, the budget report just starts off with um, an update in terms of the in-year position. So we're currently forecasting an underspend of £10,000, and that's set out on Appendix A, um, which means that we're forecast just to use just over £3,000 for reserves to support this year's budget. The Budget for 23-24 is also set out in Appendix A to the report. Um, we met with Charter Trustees um, as part of the budget workshop in December to discuss uh, some certain budget lines and priorities that they wanted to see built in. One of them is the Twinning Association um, budget increase that we've just discussed um, and agreed on. We have decided to reduce the hospitality budget from 10,000 to 9,000 pounds going forward. Um, recharges between the council and the charter trustees have increased because of increases in staffing costs at the council. And as we've mentioned earlier, the inclusion of the £10,000 budget to support the coronation activities that will be a one-off and fully funded from reserves to avoid any one-off spike in the council tax requirement. So the reserves, um, just a quick update. We're forecasting to end the year with just over £82,000 uh, which is around 65% of the, of the precept. Um, if we were to agree the budget today, 
we would include the 10,000 to support the coronation activities and over 14,000 to support the base budget position. The tax base um, has increased by almost 900 properties and that has the benefit of having more properties to um, distribute the presets so it means our charges can be reduced. So the council tax requirement and preset demands that we need to agree today is £126,084 and with the increase in the tax base and some of the items that we've set out already that means that we can freeze the council tax charge for bandy properties at £2.14. So I'll stop there Mr Mayor and happy to take any questions. Right, um, hopefully we're not brimming with questions. Um, have we got any? Um, no. um, can I ask that we agree B, um, the proposed budget as set out in Appendix A be approved, and C, that the council tax requirement and precept of £126,084 be approved, which is a freeze. So yeah, we, we seem to be quite happy on that one. So that's thank you. That's the potentially other long item dealt with. And um, I think we're on to um, review of the risk register. I'm going to have to look over someone's shoulder because I didn't print that one out because being in colour, it won't print in black and white very effectively. Risk thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes. Um, so members will hopefully re recall that this, this last was uh, reviewed in this time last year. Uh, the risk register has been updated since, and it's broadly similar, although I'm happy to say that a couple of the risks have been reduced, those being uh, the risk relating to historical and ceremonial assets and the loss of civic regalia. Uh, we are now carrying out annual asset checks. The most recent was uh, earlier this month, and uh, there was nothing missing. Uh, the transmission of the COVID-19 infection risk has been reduced due to the uh, further uptake and widespread vaccination and booster shots that we're all taking. And uh, the budget uh, for the Charter Trustees are being looked at in regular budget workshops. So we felt that the, the risk could be reduced on that basis. Uh, beyond that, it is um, hopefully uh, uh, similar to the previous year. And the recommendation is that uh, that risk should be approved. Thank you. Right, I can see, oh, I can, I can see two hands up, which... Um, I think Felicity first and then Diana. Would climate change be able to add, be added to the risk register? I know it was added for BCP. We can certainly look at it, but I mean, my sense is more of a BCP council issue than just because the activities that is for charge trustees. But should we have a look at that and take it away and just see what relevance we've got? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, just some um, on the risk register. I, I feel that dates need to be added to the register when it says action completed, should really have a date so that it's relevant. Um, for example, checking with the assets um, should have a date, January date. Um, and also the civic dignitary personal injury, you could add to the action specific training session to highlight potential risks and actions needed to avoid injury, um, just as a safeguard for people in, that, in the mayoral party. Um, and also page 28, health and safety actions. Um, I would like to add, ensure adequate lighting of steps because that doesn't always happen in venues that we go to, if that's possible. Right, have we got anyone who can help on this? Yes, thank you. I mean, in, in regarding um, action completed dates and the personal injury training session, absolutely happy to, to look at that. Regarding the lights, it wouldn't be um, within the remit of the Charter Trustees. Um, I believe that would be relating to the particular venue or globally the, the BCP uh, um, venues. So we wouldn't be able to put that on this particular risk register, but it, I do take on board your point. This may seem a little random, but I've recently been looking at public liability insurances um, for uh, 
a number of groups I'm involved with and they tend to have issues with individuals who are over 80 uh, to the point where we've had to look at explaining that perhaps some of the volunteers might not be um, fully covered <laughs> once they get past that age. And I am aware that we have had um, civic dignitaries or escorts um, and that may, may be over that age. I just wanted to be 100% sure that our insurance doesn't have an age limit at the top. I'm only, <laughs> I'm only in the over 70 category. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, we, we'll take that on board and we'll, we'll review that. Thank you. Right. We're happy with um, the document. Um, right. That then enables us to move on to item nine. Oh. It's a bit peripheral to the asset, uh, to the uh, risk register, but it's because of the mention of the asset checks, which I was involved in with the mayor. Uh, and it came to my, t I, I found out afterwards that the furniture from the mayor's parlour is not a charter trustee's asset, it's a BCP asset. Um, and I've got two questions. One, I assume the same applies to the Bournemouth Charter Trustees, Mayor's Parlour Furniture. Uh, and, and on what basis is this decreed that it's BCP asset, not a Charter Trustees asset? Good question. I think, I think there's a collective, collective lack of knowledge to answer the question, so we'll take that one away and come back with a response. We'll, we'll check the detail and come back to you. Yeah, I must know. admit, when I heard that, I was totally thinking, why? Um, you know, sort of, but, um, but anyway, yeah, um, we've had that. We've, we've, we've come to item nine, the last yeah. item on the agenda, so we are just about okay within time. Appointment to the positions of Mayor and Sheriff of Poole. Um, I don't know who sort of presents this. Um, Neil. Yes, thank you, Ms. Baird. Yes, just very briefly, just to, to officially confirm that uh, Councillor Brian Dion was uh, appointed to the position of Sheriff of Poole for 2023-24 and subsequent Mayor in 2024-2025. And for the Mayor of Poole, that would be uh, the current Deputy Mayor, which is uh, Councillor Julie Bagwell, and then subsequently Deputy Mayor again in 2024-2025. Thank you. Right. I think congratulations on... Um, Thank you. Our, I think we're just about on time. Don't yeah. I think you've done it really well. Um, and with 20 minutes in hand, so that's not too bad. That gives that me gives time to get down to 20. the lighthouse. For that the gives the team... Cuts that I'm going to. <laughs> so, um, it gives the team 20 Thank you. minutes to clear up. Right. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, officially closed the meeting. And whilst the Civic Party retires, thank you. <laughs>